How many of you have ever played with desktop server? Yes. It's awesome. Let me introduce you to that brilliant gentleman, Mr. Steven. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Let's get started. Okay, so as you know, desktop server, if you're not familiar with it, it's a uh, local host development tool, very similar to MAMP or WAMP but we really optimized it for WordPress. Um, so you can use a nice fancy GUI to create WordPress websites and do development on your local desktop, not having to pay a hosting provider. You create as many websites as you want and basically do all of your development online, offline rather, until you're ready to go staging online. Um, but there's been a lot of talk about how uh, the GUI almost kind of looks like a toy, right? It's just a little bit too easy. And, um, Today's topic is going to be top CLI recipes for WordPress development. Uh, and we're going to revisit the command line and why the command line is still important and relevant today. Uh, so we're going to start off with a couple of beginning commands, if you're not very familiar with the command line. How many people here use the command line and know how to, rather, how many people here are familiar with the command line but don't know how to change directories or manipulate the file system in the command line. You're, you're, you're beginners of the command line. Can you raise your hand? Okay. Okay, so it gives me a gauge as to how quickly I want to blow through just the beginning section. And then we'll move on to a little bit more advanced topics. Um, okay. So in the beginning, uh, we're talking about the very beginning, like 1920. This is before computers um, in terms of transistors. Uh, there was a device called the teletype machine. And in 1920, the teletype machine was invented to communicate to other teletype machines. It's literally like a typewriter, just a step up above Morse code, so that people could type on a keyboard and receive messages on another teletype machine and type back. Uh, but it wasn't until around the 1960s that the teletype machine came into play with computers. Um, about the late 1950s, uh, universities were bringing mainframes online, computers, transistor-based computers that occupied huge rooms came online, and they found that the most appropriate way to communicate with them, if you're across town, is to retrofit the teletype machine to talk to that computer, whether it was at a university or um, at a big mainframe at some corporation, you could literally pick up the phone, slam down your receiver onto a teletype machine, and type away. Um, <clears throat> now, the teletype machine in 1960 brought about the alphanumeric language, or the alphanumeric uh, set called ASCII. So how many people here are familiar with ASCII? All right, awesome. So before you could have a computer language, you really needed to take a step back and have a computer alphabet. And so ASCII became the standard in 1960 for people to type on the teletype machine, send BASIC, which also came about in the 60s, to send commands over to the mainframe and get the results back. But the results didn't come back on a screen, and in fact, they didn't really come back on a typewriter. They came back in a punch card. So you have these devices that, you can see the punch card here, um, and it, it, it allowed you to see the results of, say, basic commands that you could type in and then send to a machine and then have them come back. Uh, the, the punch card was kind of the precursor to the USB drive, only it used a lot of trees, right? So we've definitely come a long way. Um, but that notion that the teletype machine or the command line, if you will, uh, is so dated really isn't true. Now, the teletype machine itself was retired in 1984, I believe. Does anybody else know what came out about 1983, 1984? The GUI. The GUI was born. In fact, the uh, Apple Lisa was one of the first machines, and then came the Apple Macintosh in 1984. MIT released X Windows, which is basically the window manager that uh, was replicated in Windows. And it kind of started a little bit of a holy war as to whether or not the GUI or the, the command line was the way to go. Now, the GUI is fantastic. Um, you know, we design tools for WordPress developers that are very GUI-centric because it really ushered in a whole slew of users to utilize the computer without having to uh, know all these arcane uh, commands on a command line. But Wired Magazine had an interesting quote, and the quote is, 
The command line isn't a crusty old-fashioned way to interact with a computer, made obsolete by GUIs, but rather a fantastically flexible and powerful way to perform tasks. I'm going to show you how some there, there are some tasks that you can do on the command line that you still cannot do as efficiently, or even at all, using a GUI tool. <clears throat> And so another, another quote by uh, co-founder of Unix, Rob Pike, he's actually the uh, developer of the Go language. When people are using a particular system, say that the command line is better because it can do things that a GUI can't, or you can't do rather in a GUI, they're not talking about the strengths of the command line interface, but rather the shortcomings of the GUI. So now with modern systems, we have a number of choices between command lines. If you're a Windows user, uh, you might be familiar with PowerShell. MS-DOS is a popular command line that was used in the early PCs. Uh, then there's ZSH and Bash. And ZSH and Bash are very similar. Bash kind of does 80% of what ZHS, uh, ZSH does. But uh, the Bash command line really has the longest history out of the, uh, the four that are presented here. Um, BASH stands for Born Again Shell. That's actually a rewrite of the original Unix uh, command line, which was called Born Shell. So if we take a look at each of the uh, different command line choices, like PowerShell and MS-DOS, uh, it looks like that BASH is kind of reaching the, the de facto standard, if you will. And why is that important? Well, if you're a Windows user <clears throat> and you've... Uh, how many people back up their WordPress website? I hope you guys all back up your WordPress websites and you download an archive. And then how many people use caching? Like W3 Total Cache, Super Cache, right? So if you get this archive and you download it, and you happen to be a Windows user, and actually this can happen on Macintosh as well, um, sometimes you get this path too long trying to um, unzip that archive. And it's not actually limited to just the GUI. You can. Um, use an unzip utility from a third party like WinZip or WinRAR to unarchive a zip file. And this, this error happens because sometimes your backups contain these cache directories. Or sometimes plugin authors develop on maybe a Linux system, but they don't even take into account the Windows system where you have these really long file paths. Does anybody know what the limit is on the file paths on Windows? Did you say? 8.3, that's, that's MS-DOS, but, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's 256. About that, that's like, that's about right. It's actually, I think, 248. So they take a couple of bytes for, for some other reasons. Um, so if you encounter this, you can always go to the command line to try to take care of it. Uh, but unfortunately, you do have to be wise about which command line you choose. So here's an example on the command prompt in MS-DOS. Uh, we tried to unzip a file, but we still encountered that the, the text file is too long. I kind of went out of my way in this particular demonstration to, to show a really long file name, but it is an issue that happens, and it can happen to you, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> we're really hoping that PowerShell was going to correct for this issue, because PowerShell is the leading uh, command line in the latest version of Windows 7, 8, 9, and, or 8 and 10. Uh, but you still do encounter this issue. And yeah, it's 248 characters for the file name, um, or rather for the directory, and then I believe the file names are limited to 260 characters. So that can be a problem if you're trying to unzip files. But hell has frozen over. Bash, which is a command line on Unix and Linux systems, and the default command line that you actually find on Macintosh computers, is now coming to Windows. So the latest build, yeah, can we get an applaud? Um, Microsoft is now including the Linux Bash command line in the next version of Windows. So you can actually uh, activate it now. I believe if you have a developer, you're part of the MSN developer network, you can get a hold of it. Um, I think someone had mentioned that it was free earlier I was talking to. Uh, but yeah, so that's definitely coming, and it does not have that shortcoming. If you want to delete a file, 
Uh, again, you can use a third-party utility like WinZip or Unzip, but then you have a problem um, unzipping that file and then trying to delete it. You can't get it off your desktop. But if you're in the bash command line, you can. Uh, so we're going to go over some basic file operation side-by-side uh, -side with the window manager to illustrate that. So bash is the way to go, the de facto standard. Um, and there's several ways you can get started with bash. <clears throat> well, if you're a Windows user, we always had the Sigwin project. It's really come a long way. Someone else had mentioned Chocolatey earlier I was talking to, and uh, that has come a long way as well. In fact, it's kind of, I think a lot of the development in Chocolatey is going into the Windows 10 update that you're going to see where bash becomes native to the Windows uh, interface. Um, and then there's desktop server. If you want to use a command line and you happen to be a desktop server user, there's a new plugin that I wrote um, and it's available at github.com, steverevo forward slash vscli. And that's going to give you a command line that's all primed and ready for WordPress development. Well, what does that mean? It has a WPCLI built into it. It has Composer. It has uh, even Node and um, NPM package managers. It's basically ready for you to uh, get down and dirty and, and, and do WordPress development on the command line. Um, it's cross-platform. So you also have uh, DSCLI available on desktop server for Macintosh. Even though Macintosh already has a native bash uh, command line interface, what the desktop server plugin is going to do is it's going to install a separate private version of Homebrew and basically spice it up. So you get WPCLI, you get Composer, you get Split, you get a lot of these commands like wget, which is missing. Um, if you have an existing homebrew installation, it's not going to interfere with that. Uh, likewise, it's true with Sigwin. If you already have Sigwin, you can still use desktop server with DSCLI. And then if you're a Linux user, how many Linux users do we have out there? All right, you guys are already awesome, so there you go. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to show an example of basically installing DSCLI because uh, <clears throat> there are a number of choices you can go with the command line. Of course, if you're using Vagrant or you're using um, MAMP, you can, you can pre-configure your, your command line interface, but this is definitely the easiest. So I'm going to go through this process of installing. And so it's distributed as a zip file on Macintosh. On Windows, we make it an executable because the tool itself contains a lot of long file names. And again, as I explained, it's not going to install correctly if we try to unzip it on Windows. So there's a self-extracting uh, executable. And once it downloads, you can see how easy it is to install. And then how many Windows users do we have right now? All right, so we still got a good, a good mix right on. So when you install the plugin, it's going to install into the, the uh, on Windows, it's going to be the XLAMP Lite folder, DS Plugins folder. So the DS Plugins folder is basically a folder where you can install desktop server plugins. Now, desktop server plugin is just like a WordPress plugin. In fact, you can take a WordPress plugin and pop it into that folder. And uh, now that plugin will be active in all of your WordPress development sites. Um, Sometimes that's not appropriate, but it, is can, it can be convenient. Uh, the desktop server plugin folder is primarily used for developer plugins. For instance, we've got a plugin out there that allows you to bypass login. You ever get a, um, an archive from a client, and what's the first thing that you do? You install it, but maybe they didn't give you credentials to log in. So the bypass plugin, um, bypass login plugin, is a perfect WordPress plugin that you can install in the DS Plugins folder. It'll become active in your development sites and you can log in right away. Not something you want to deploy, right? Um, <clears throat> at least I don't recommend it. But by keeping a separate DS Plugins folder, uh, you can avoid having to deal with that. Let's see here. my place. 
just one second. All right, so we downloaded the plugin. Ah, long video. Sorry, guys. Just a moment. Okay, so that's going to go ahead and do its installation. <clears throat> It's going to be a little bit of a heavy plugin if you're a Windows user because it is installing a lot of little tiny files. And those files are the, uh, the command line utilities like split, like uh, wget, um, a lot of little binaries that basically make up the Unix operating system, or rather the Linux operating system. When you install the desktop server for um, CLI plugin, you're basically installing SIGWIN or portions of SIGWIN along with WPCLI and what have you. And then once it's installed, you can fire up desktop server and you're gonna get a new option. And those of you that haven't seen desktop server, you can see a demonstration of how we're gonna create a WordPress website um, in under five minutes. The first thing to do is to start or stop the server. And you're gonna check to see what developer plugins you have installed. Uh, and there's a DSCLI plugin. We just check it off and click next. What that's going to do is it's going to cycle the Apache server that desktop server uses, and it's going to make sure that that plugin is available in all of your WordPress development websites. And so desktop server is going to uh, create the database. It's going to configure your um, your WP config file, and I can show that here in just a second. So the default option is to create a new development website, and I'm going to show you how the command line interface plays into this. So we can type in a testing development website name um, and choose the WordPress uh, 4.5. And all the Apache logs, or rather the Apache uh, vhost files are going to be configured for you. Your WP config is going to be configured for you. All the, uh, the keys are going to be salted. And then we can start a new installation. So testing.dev is our fictitious domain name. And we're just going to make a couple of websites here. This first one is going to be testing site. Put in the password and the email address. <clears throat> okay, now we can go ahead and log in. Okay, so when you have the desktop server uh, CLI plugin activated within this development environment, uh, you're going to get the typical admin bar, but you'll notice there's a DSCLI icon on the admin bar. If you click that, you're going to get the command line pop up. And I mentioned that it's using SIGWIN. That's basically what you see here. Now, this is a little bit different because the command line isn't going to start up in your home folder. It's going to automatically put you into the development website that you're working on. For instance, testing.dev. Anybody know why? It's a prerequisite for WPCLI. You need to be in the document root of your WordPress website to use WPCLI. So but before we get to WPCLI, let's take a look at typical file system navigation. So we had a, a couple of users, actually several users, that said that they don't use the command line on a regular basis. So we're going to go through and, and blow through some simple commands like how to list files, how to change directories, etc. We're going to do that side by side with the window manager so that you can get a, a kind of a general idea and 
see that the command line really isn't that scary. So on a window manager, it seems like it's really forgiving, right? Because we have this trash bin that we can always undo operations. Well, the command line is actually pretty forgiving as well. If you would mistype something, nine out of 10 times, you usually get a command not found. So it's not really that scary when you're typing on the command line. But what I'm doing here is I'm going to show you how to list files. Now, when you open up the window manager, you're usually placed in your home directory. Now, on uh, the command line, when you open up a command line, you're placed in the home directory as well, but you just don't know it. There's a key command that you want to type, which is ls to list files, and that's going to show you the corresponding files like you would if you just open up a document window. So if you want to go to the documents folder, we're going to go ahead and type cd, which stands for change directory. And all these commands are listed on my website, so you can kind of use it as a cheat sheet to get familiar with the command line interface. Um, and then on the GUI, you can see we're in the documents folder, and there's a websites folder. And that's typically where a desktop server stores its uh, development websites. So if you click the websites folder, you go into that. The equivalent command, again, is cd. And you can put that within quotes, websites. And then just press enter, and it's going to pop us into the websites folder. And then just type ls again, and you should be able to see the, the folders or the files that are there. <clears throat> now, to create a new folder, you typically type, you know, right click a, a, or click on file and new folder, and you create a new folder in the GUI. Now on the command line, you're going to use make directory, which is mkdar, followed by the folder name that you want to create, and you can see there's a new folder there. So really simple. On you know Windows, you can right click a folder to delete it, uh, then go ahead and select delete. And on the command line, we have a powerful command line operation called rm to remove. And then it has these options. And the options are followed by a hyphen for rf to remove a directory uh, and all of its subsequent children. So if that directory has any files in it, they're going to get blasted too. And so you can see now it's gone. <clears throat> So that covers changing directory, listing files, um, and removing directories. Now the command line typically comes with a built-in editor called Nano, a lot like edit on the old Microsoft Windows um, MS-DOS command prompt. Anybody use edit? Am I dating myself there? Yeah, okay, so you're familiar with it. Um, Nano is really, really easy. A lot of people use another terminal editing program called, uh, or file editing program called VI. I'm going to kind of stay away from that. It's a little bit more advanced, but if you're familiar with edit or familiar with typical text editor, Nano is a way to go. It's available on all platforms. And I'm just going to write a, a quick hello world app and then press control X to exit. And it's going to go ahead and confirm a file name, press Y, and you'll see the file pop up in the window manager over there. <clears throat> so copying files. Uh, now they have a text file, you want to be more comfortable in the command line. Copying is easy. CP stands for copy. You type the file name, and then the file name you want to copy to, and there you go. So that's your crash course introduction to the command line, how to manipulate files uh, in parallel to the window manager, which you're probably already familiar with. But all commands on the command line, um, they're really not that difficult. Once you get the basics down, you can write scripts, you can automate processes. Uh, but getting help is always a good question, right? Well, there's several places you can get help on the command line. When you're in the bash command line, typically you can always type man, which stands for manual, followed by the command. And it's going to uh, show you a, a manual on how to get help, <clears throat> or a manual on that command. Uh, in addition, all commands usually have a hyphen hyphen help shortcut. So if you forget how to make a directory, you can just type hyphen hyphen help, and then up comes a quick cheat sheet of all sorts of options. And then um, man is something else that I mentioned. It's going to give you a way more detailed breakdown. It's actually the user manual for MK, uh, how to make a directory. Okay. So now you guys know the basics, let's get down into WordPress 
and see how WPCLI, which is an enhancement of the command line, is going to help you automate some processes. So the top WPCLI commands that we always get, um, that we're always using in support to help users out, is how to back up your work, how to roll back your work, import data, and then how to do search and replace. So exporting your database. You've been working on your WordPress website. Um, at some point, you're going to want to maybe try some new plugins out. Uh, things can get really destructive. We're, God, we're down to five minutes already, huh? <clears throat> you can type WPDB export, and that's going to back up your database. Really a good idea before you try some new plugin so that you can recover your database uh, if you need to. So that's an example. WPDB export, it's going to create a file called uh, backup.sql, and we can see it there. Okay, then search and replace. So if you have a number of URLs inside your WordPress website that you need to change, maybe you're using a content development network and um, you forgot to update some URLs, or in this case we just have a site title, testing site, say we want to replace that all over the place. You can use a WPCLI command to do search and replace. And I'm going to type WP search and replace, testing site, followed by, um, say, computer history as a new title. So everywhere in my WordPress website, because a WordPress website is not a text file, you can't really do search and replace, um, WPCLI has a search and replace tool that'll make that really easy for you. So if I hit refresh on the web browser, we're gonna see that changes to computer history. So anywhere within that website, that string gets replaced globally. Okay, and then restoring the website's just as easy. It's gonna be WPCLI import, and we can restore the website. So I wanted to jump into, because we're running out of time here, uh, PHP unit testing. How many people here use PHP unit testing now? Okay, so you can get started with PHP unit testing um, using DSCLI. It has PHP unit testing built into it. And in fact, there is a, uh, a blueprint for desktop server. It's available at Steve Arriva, uh, github.com forward slash Steve Arivo, and it's called the WordPress PHP Unit Testing Blueprint. You can use that in desktop server, or you can unpack it, and you'll see WordPress in there, the ability to get WordPress plus all the core files to do PHP unit testing. So I'm gonna create a new website based on uh, WordPress and PHP unit testing. I'm just going to skip ahead and <clears throat> install WordPress. So I've created a new development site called phptesting.dev based on that blueprint. And when I log into the admin screen, we're going to get that DSCUI prompt there. If I click that, I can now type PHP unit test on the command line, and it's going to run through uh, any unit tests that I've set up. And this is going to be a quick template for you to start testing your own plugins. We're going to see it fail here. So if you download the PHP, uh, the WordPress PHP blueprint, you'll have a blueprint ready for testing your plugins and your themes. <clears throat> and 
fact, I'm going to go ahead and, and create a, an example test here. So it's going to be like a typical WordPress website, only you're going to have a testing directory next to your WP content and your other WordPress files. And there's two files in that testing folder, the bootstrap file and the test sample file. So if you look at the bootstrap sample file, um, you can list any themes that you want to start testing under PHP unit. And you can also list a number of plugins that you want to start testing. So uh, what I did was I created a little framework there. You can add your theme like 2015. Um, and then we're going to change the uh, hello.php. That's going to be our plugin that we're going to test because WordPress comes with Hello Dolly. And now if we go ahead and run um, uh, edit our text sample file, you can go in and create a number of tests. And this framework here is going to allow you to create a couple of unit tests. In this case, we're going to test for the uh, 2015 version 1.5. So say we're doing some testing, we're making some modifications, and our core theme needs to be, uh, say, 2015 1.5. We can create a unit test for that. And then lastly, let's say uh, we want to test Hello Dolly. Make sure that's activated. So there's the... Uh, assert true, and we're going to make sure that hello.php is true. And that'll tell us whether or not the theme is actually activated. Now when we type php unit tests, okay, hopefully you'll see our, pa our tests pass, and there you go. So we've tested the Hello Dolly plugin. We've tested um, whether or not we're actually running the 2015 theme. Okay, so to get started with PHP unit testing, like in desktop server, um, you can go to github.com, Steve Arrivo, forward slash WordPress PHP unit, and then you can um, drop that, that blueprint into desktop server. If you're not using desktop server, there is a blueprint.php file. You can take that PHP file and you just need to execute it with the PHP command on the command line. So PHP space blueprint.php, that'll go ahead and go out to wordpress.org, get the latest version of WordPress. It'll go out to the uh, subversion repo and download all the testing units that are a part of the WordPress core that the developer team put together, and then you can start doing testing right away on your desktop. And then lastly, you want to create a website. You can create as many testing websites as you'd like. Okay, so that does it for uh, PHP unit testing. I went ahead and put together a couple of the links that we talked about. Um, about getting general help. Bash uh, stackflow.com is a great place to get help if you're not familiar with the Bash command line and the manual and the online dash dash help trick doesn't quite work for you. Plenty of examples there. Uh, the desktop server CLI plugin is available on GitHub under my username, Steve Arrivo. And then under, um, for PHP unit testing, you got the blueprint WordPress hyphen PHP unit ready to go. And then, uh, last but not least, the make.wordpress.org uh, website to actually look at the official handbook on testing with WordPress and PHP unit. Okay, and uh, that's it for intro to the CLI and how to do PHP unit testing and how to manipulate the interface. If you have any questions, you can always email me directly. You can hit me up on Twitter. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think we're, yes. No, you, you definitely don't want to do that. So as I mentioned, the command line is really forgiving. If you do do have a typo, you, know, you don't have a recycle bin, but nine out of 10 times you do get the command not found. So uh, 
yeah, but that, that's pretty much it. Yeah, you really can't be afraid of the command line. It's not going away. It's going to be there for a while. Um, question. So there's a 3.9 that's coming. I can tell you that much. Yeah, so we're, we're making the transition to 4.0, and this is all the process. The command line interface that functions on Windows, delivering bash to Windows is really huge. Major, it needs to be vetted. There's lots of projects that are doing it. Um, but we wanted to choose the right project. So the DSCLI plugin is a precursor to that. Yeah. Okay, I think we're done. Uh, yeah, so stevarevo.com, shortly after this presentation, you'll be able to find them on my website. Okay. All right.